Um, so, as I say, the topic that I was asked to present on was diaphragmatic ultrasound. Um, and I have to say that anytime um, I'm asked to speak about this, I feel extremely excited. Um, so this is my Limbrook class 3B. Uh, you will see that this is me circled in red here. Uh, and this is Vanessa Channel. And about six months after this uh, photograph is taken, I'm going to lose the school spelling bee. And I'm going to lose to Vanessa's channel because when we get asked to spell the word diaphragm, I'm going to skip the G and she's not. Uh, and so it is really kind of um, burned into my heart, this word. And I'm gl glad that decades later, I'm finally being given the chance to sort of hemi-diaphragmatically redeem myself. So the learning objectives of this presentation are to describe the utility of diaphragmatic ultrasound, explain the technique used both B-mode and M-mode, and recognize the valuable pathologies by ultrasound. Um, and this is very important as the diaphragm is the main respiratory muscle and impairment can result in severe problems with respiration. And infants are much more significantly affected by both unilateral as well as bilateral uh, diaphragmatic paralysis than ad adults. Um, and this can result in increased morbidity and mortality. As such, it's very important to recognize uh, when there are issues early on. While many clinical scenarios can result uh, in abnormal motion in the diaphragm, in the children, um, the situations that we encounter most commonly uh, would be following thoracic surgery, most commonly cardiac, and that's due to injury of the phrenic nerve. Uh, or it can be seen in association with uh, birth trauma, in particular brachial plexus injury. Um, the reported incidence following cardiac surgery uh, is quite variable. Um, some places in the literature report as low as 0.3% and others up to 20%. Um, and the purported mechanism is that it can actually be due to uh, a direct severance of the phrenic artery. It might be due to cautery. It might be due to stretching, um, any of these mechanisms. Okay, so um, why is this important? I'm sorry, your faces are going all over the place. I'm just going to pop you onto another screen. Um, so um, infants and children have very weak and underdeveloped intercostal muscles. Um, and so their ventilation is quite reliant upon the diaphragm. Uh, therefore, even the unilateral paralysis can have um, a severe effect on them and result in ventilatory failure or the need for prolonged support. Uh, early diagnosis can be quite helpful um, because it may serve to predict uh, outcomes. It can sort of direct um, knowing which patients might require uh, a longer time on non-invasive uh, ventilation following extubation, et cetera, or even determine which children might have to go on to have a diaphragmatic plication. Um, importantly, chest radiographs have very little utility in the diagnosis, um, especially during the neonatal period. One study reported that only 34% of frontal uh, chest radiographs could detect an ab um, abnormalities of the diaphragm. Um, and most importantly, ultrasound is useful for uh, investigating more than just paralysis. Um, other advantages to ultrasound is unlike fluoroscopy or CT or MR, um, it can be done at the bedside, which is uh, can be particularly helpful in some of these post-op cardiac patients. As you know, it doesn't involve radiation. Um, unlike in fluoroscopy, where you um, uh, are watching in an AP projection typically, um, in ultrasound, we get a much better view of the posterior diaphragm, which is the, mo the most mobile portion of it. Uh, you can do fluoro, of course, in a lateral position. Uh, however, then it can be very difficult to distinguish which is the right and which is the left hemidiaphragm. Okay, so how do we do this? All right, so firstly, uh, B-mode sonography is performed with a curvilinear transducer, and I know I've shown you here with a linear, for which I apologize. Um, to evaluate the upper abdomen and the lower chest. Uh, and this is done to exclude adjacent pathology. So for example, here we have a nine month old who had a retroperitoneal teratoma um, with gliomatosis peritone, and they were found to have a suprodiaphragmatic lesional uh, deposit. Okay. Both hemidiaphragms are then evaluated. So this includes scanning the midline uh, in an oblique transverse sub-xiphoid plane um, to obtain comparative imaging of both sides. That would be an image um, much like this. Then both the right 
and the left are separately interrogated, both in the transverse and the sagittal plane, um, uh, to look at, uh, both at the configuration and then for the movement. We then do M mode. And what I'm trying to show on this uh, schematic from uh, Monica Eppelman's paper is that during inspiration, the normal diaphragm contracts and moves caudally or toward the transducer. And this is uh, recorded as an upward inflection on uh, the M mode tracing. And then during normal expiration, the diaphragm moves up away from the transducer. And that's that downward deflection that you're seeing on the curve. Um, when analyzing um, the tracings, two parameters need to be assessed. Okay, uh, that is the amplitude of excursion um, as well as the direction of motion. Um, it's absolutely essential to correlate uh, the M mode tracing with the phase of respiration. And this can be done in a few ways. Um, there is an, a pause at the end of expiration that one can look for, or it can be very helpful to have an assistant with you, be that the respiratory therapist, um, an additional clinician, so anyone uh, who can state when the um, patient's abdomen is going up and down um, or have a hand on the chest, anything to know what um, corresponds to what. Um, for patients who are on mechanically assisted ventilation, this needs to be temporarily disconnected uh, so that spontaneous breathing can be examined. And that's just another good reason why it might be helpful to have a respiratory uh, therapist present at the bedside. Okay. Um, so again, regarding uh, the technique, the amplitude of the excursion of the hemidiaphragm is measured on the vertical axis of the tracing, and it's done from baseline at end of expiration to the point of maximum inspiration on the graph. So on this um, image that I've provided here, uh, the cursors have been correctly placed, and that is going from point A at end expiration to point B at um, peak inspiration. And we can see that there is an, a distance provided or um, excursion of 0 0.7 centimeters. Now, why is this technique important? So I'm going to give you another example here. Um, in this first example, uh, the cursors have been incorrectly placed with a vertical orientation. Um, and while that is not the worst thing, it does um, involve a degree of um, estimation as to where uh, the more inferior uh, marker is placed. Now, more problematically, in this second example, um, it has been measured from peak inspiration down to that nadir. And you can see that actually the end of expiration, or this distance here, A, if we've measured properly, is much shorter than B, which we've actually measured. So here, um, we would be falsely exaggerating diaphragmatic excursion if not um, properly measured. Okay, so then with respect to the motion itself, it can be described as normal, decreased, absent, or paradoxical. And we'll go through some of these. It is considered normal when it meets these criteria. So it needs to occur in the correct, uh, correct direction, i.e. toward the transducer with inspiration. The excursion needs to be greater than four millimeters. And the difference of excursion between the two sides, right and left, should be less than 50%. Okay, so let's go through some examples. Here we have a four month old, I believe, uh, post-op cardiac patient. Um, and we see a typical post-operative paraphernalia um, and findings on this radiograph. Uh, and we note that there's elevation of the left hemidiaphragm. When we look at the ultrasound images of uh, comparing both the right to the left uh, hemidiaphragms, we see on the right side that there is normal excursion occurring in the appropriate direction. Um, and with a distance of 1.6 centimeters. And on the left, there's really no measurable excursion whatsoever. And maybe even there's slightly paradoxical motion. Okay, here's a more dramatic example. Again, post-op cardiac patient with elevation of the left hemidiaphragm. On this patient, we see again, a normal excursion on the right with flagrant paradoxical motion on the left. And you can note that the sonographer um, has helpfully labeled the nadirs as being during the inspiratory phase. Okay, now let's look at left-sided paresis. And by the way, when I use the term paresis, I mean dysfunction, i.e. the diaphragm is going in the correct direction, but not to the expected degree. 
So this is a two week old male. Um, and again, we can see that there is normal excursion on the right. And on the left, excursion is occurring in the appropriate direction, but the amplitude is dampened. And although it is over four millimeters, you can see that there's greater than 50% difference between the two sides. Therefore, this is abnormal. Now, thankfully, a follow-up ultrasound was obtained six days later, um, which shows substantial improvement now uh, with the left diaphragm uh, demonstrating excursion of greater than one centimeter and with normalization of the ratio between the sides. Okay, let's take another example. Um, occasionally, we get asked to perform ultrasound to help differentiate between congenital diaphragmatic hernia and diaphragmatic eventration, and it can be extremely challenging. Uh, sometimes we get lucky and we're able to tell, uh, and other times these patients bounce between the modalities ultrasound, CT, MR, and we seem to recommend back um, in circles upon ourselves. Um, this case here is fairly unambiguous. The left image shows that thick um, and truncated diaphragm. Um, and then we see that the adrenal and upper pole of the kidney are within the inferior thorax. And then the image on the right with that big B there, that's labeling loops of bowel that were present more superior within the hemithorax. Here, I believe we have a cine clip. And you're going to see, um, it, we're in the sagittal plane here. You've got that blind ending diaphragmatic free edge that's moving down and you can see loops of peristalsing bowel that are up there in the thorax. So this one, probably we knew it from the radiograph. Okay. Um, here's an interesting one. So this was the baseline abdominal radiograph of, I think it was a 12 year old male who um, was post chromocytoma resection. Um, however, six weeks later, he presented with abdominal pain and vomiting. And you can see that there's quite a substantial interval change in the contour of that right hemidiaphragm that's now asymmetrically elevated. So he went on to have an ultrasound, um, which showed that diaphragmatic free edge um, or defect uh, with herniation of bowel and a mental fat into the inferior thorax. A confirmatory CT was performed, um, which showed the presence of a diaphragmatic defect as a post-operative complication. Okay, this one's a little bit more challenging. So this came to us as a query CDH versus eventration. Um, we see the radiographs of this uh, five-day-old infant showing it in opacity that's there anteriorly and inferiorly in the right hemithorax, and there's loss of the medial silhouette of the right um, hemidiaphragm. So we kind of questioned, uh, could this be an uh, eventration? Could this be a hernia? Probably it's an eventration, but how can we be certain? So an ultrasound was performed. And correlating to that finding seen on the chest radiograph, here we have the sagittal ultrasound image, um, and we're seeing the anterior aspect of the right hemidiaphragm to be quite markedly uh, elevated with the liver kind of pooching up beneath. When we did high resolution uh, linear images of this region, you can see that the diaphragm does look like it's present, it's just quite thinned in this region. Okay. Um, and then when M mode is put on, we're going to show you anteriorly um, with that uh, uh, line from the transducer coming through the area of uplifting, you can see that the motion is quite diminished uh, compared to the posterior aspect of the diaphragm where you have a much, um, a much more normal uh, excursion. Um, classically, eventrations are stated to demonstrate paradoxical motion, um, but sometimes it can just be uh, demonstrate reduced motion such as this. Okay, here we have another post-op cardiac patient um, and they have asymmetric elevation of at least a portion of the right hemidiaphragm. And then when we did ultrasound, uh, similar to the previous case, we have that little uh, uplifting anteriorly. And on M mode interrogation, uh, the posterior aspect of the diaphragm moved uh, normally, and the anterior aspect or even traded uh, portion showed paradoxical motion. Okay, um, here we have another case of eventration. So I'm going to show you the posterior motion of the diaphragm on the cine clip so that you can see. I'm going to tell you that with inspiration, it's moving appropriately uh, downwards um, as compared to 
the more anterior aspect of the diaphragm at that site of eventration, um, where we have much less motion than at the back. Oh, my slides do not wish to slip. Okay, this is a really interesting presentation. Um, so this seven month old uh, came to our emergency room department with the mom complaining um, that every time she fed the baby, the chest gurgled. Um, and on these radiographs, we see that there's a lucency that's projecting over the right inferior hemithorax. And so a differential comes to mind. Could this be a congenital diaphragmatic hernia? Well, I guess, but it would be pretty unusual to have that much bowel up there and not really see the soft tissue of the liver. Could this be an eventration? Well, again, we still kind of need to account for why there's so much bowel po pooching up uh, toward the chest there. So then also in the differential would be, could this be a hiatal hernia? And in cases of hiatal hernia, they can certainly project over the right base like this. So ultrasound was performed. Um, and what you're looking at here uh, is you can see um, the diaphragmatic free edge. You can see a large portion of the stomach is within the chest and the liver appears to be subdiaphragmatic. Um, on the images to the right, you can actually see the sort of neck of the stomach coming through the hiatus there between the IVC and the aorta. So the patient's interesting sort of clinical presentation as well as the radiographic findings would be most in keeping with a hiatal hernia. Here we have a cine clip. Um, again, showing that diaphragmatic motion inferiorly with a large portion of the stomach and a little bit of the mental fat uh, up there in the, uh, in the chest. And just for fun, um, an upper GI study was performed, which now a uh, post feed or post contrast shows essentially the entirety of the stomach to be within the um, inferior thorax and sort of rotated on its axis. So that's a hiatal hernia. Okay, and in this case, we have a three month old who um, had a pneumonia and they have white out of their left hemithorax with tracheal deviation and mediastinal shift toward the right. Um, it's hard to know how much of this was consolidation versus effusion. And I suspect that's probably why um, an ultrasound was being performed. Um, if you look uh, below uh, where into the upper abdomen where I've put my yellow arrows there, um, you can almost see that it looks like the stomach is downwardly displaced. Um, and when ultrasound images were obtained, so this is transverse midline comparing right with left, you can see that the left uh, hemidiaphragm is indeed downwardly displaced um, due to the presence of that very complex uh, empyema. Um, and when MMOB was performed, uh, you can see that uh, even diaphragmatic motion is compromised um, based on the presence of that effusion. So I hope that uh, I've reached we have reached the end and I should say, I hope that we've uh, gone through um, these learning objectives. Uh, with that, I'd really, really like to take a quick moment to thank my clinical colleagues, in particular, our incredible sonographers. Um, the Sick Kids crew are here with me in good times and in bad. Um, and in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Sandra Taves, one of our uh, sonographers who is a crucial contributor to helping me find some of these cases. So thank you. Oops, and I have references that just disappeared. All right, thank you so much, Shan. That was super interesting. Um, be, before we switch over to the second part of the um, session, I just thought it'd be nice to just spend a few minutes kind of just having a discussion, just talking a little bit more about, um, you know, some of the topics you presented. And, you know, uh, Judy and Hattie, I'm curious uh, just kind of what your, you know, personal practices are. I, I would say for us, it, um, you know, we're, we're using diaphragm ultrasound, but I, I would say, you know, especially looking at, you know, a lot of the nuance uh, that you just presented as far as, um, you know, measurements and, and a lot of that stuff, I think we're, we're losing a lot of that. Uh, I'm, I'm curious for, for Judy and Hytui, just how you guys are using this clinically at your institutions. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because um, I wish I had seen your presentations like way, way long time ago, because um, one of the clinicians was like, yeah, can you measure the amplitude? I'm like, what? Like, we don't do that. And he's like, well, at 6K we did. And I was like, oh, well, okay. Um, so yes, I then I had to like educate myself, but it would have been lovely um, to have known in advance. So, um, you know, since then we try to, but I haven't successfully gotten all of my sonographers to do it consistently 
so my biggest question is, is it just training or do you have like, um, your apps person, you know, just create something? Um, no, it's just training. And I mean, if they're used to doing RIs, um, for the kidneys, it's really no different. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And then when it's not, um, perfectly regular, how do you know which ones to choose? Oh, great question. Um, so, uh, most papers are recommending that you watch over at least four respiratory cycles to try and get something that looks like an average. And then uh, it, it's kind of a gestalt. It's not picking the tallest or picking the shortest. It's uh, what is looking most, I guess, like the median. Uh, I was curious too, from, do you have a radiologist always present during these exams? You know, I, I thought it was really nice how you kind of showed the, you know, the sonographers labeling them with inspiration. I, I would say that's not yeah. something we routinely do. And I think it'd be super helpful. So I'm definitely going to try to implement that. Um, so how often do you have a radiologist present versus how often do you have the sonographer just independently perform these? Um, typically these are independently performed because most of them are portable examinations on the CCU um, or NICU. Uh, if it's a question of, um, hernia versus eventration. Uh, many of us radiologists do like to go up and scan and see if we can find that sort of H-shaped um, diaphragmatic defect. Um, for the paralysis cases, I um, wouldn't say that we're really ever there, but uh, yes, our sonographers always meticulously label when inspiration is. Um, I'm not sure how often they are doing that in the company of somebody else versus putting their hand on the patient's chest. Um, I suspect more often than not, it's easier to have the bedside nurse present to kind of state when the patient is breathing in. And then one other question I had as far as the kind of technical aspects, you know, I, I know you talked about ventilated patients and you, the importance of the patient spontaneously breathing. Mm -hmm. Is that still true for if they're spontaneously breathing, but say they're on BiPAP or some kind of external support like that, do you still stop that or does that have an effect or do you want them yes. to be completely off any kind of support? Yes, essentially you don't want any positive pressure that could um, be falsely exaggerating diaphragmatic excursion because it's pushing it down further. Okay. And then I have a couple of questions uh, that I'm getting from our audience. Uh, so the first question was, uh, for M mode, how much does the angle of the line relative to the diaphragm affect the tracing or measurement? I don't know how much it um, how much it actually affects from a quantitative standpoint. Um, I can state that all all we do is just like aim for kind of the peak of the diaphragm, um, and however you can get that uh, from that sub xiphoid um, approach. So we don't worry about it. Okay. And then the next question was after, if you have a patient that's, you know, on some kind of external support, uh, do you wait some certain period of time for the CO2 to rise to increase their respiratory drive? Or do you, does that matter at all? Um, you know what? I actually don't know the answer to that question, um, whether it does have an impact on it. Um, I mean, it makes sense that it would. Uh, I suspect that between the time, well, not I suspect that between the time of actually removing the respiratory uh, support and getting um, set up, you know, there are several respirations in that interval, but we're not waiting, you know, 10 minutes, uh, especially since many of these patients can't tolerate that. Right, right. Um, and the next question was, how often are your scans inconclusive for CDH versus even tracing? You know, like you mentioned, I think that's really challenging for us. One, one thing I will mention uh, just real quick before I um, ask for your response to that was, I really liked your linear images. I, I would say most often we're using the curve, the curved probe, and I, you know, really closely interrogating the the substance of the diaphragm with those linear. I thought those images were really nice. They they were not doing that as often as I think we probably should. But um, in your experience, when you when you get the question of CDH versus eventration, how often are you able to confidently answer that? Ooh, confidently. <laughs> um, I would say. And again, I'm just pulling numbers out of the ether here, um, maybe 60%. And I would say that we have a few patients floating around, as I say, who are just going through this sort of cyclic imaging. They've never been operated on. We can't answer it on ultrasound. And so they go to CT, then we discuss them in our um, surgical conference, then they go back to ultrasound and none of us know, <laughs> but they're doing okay. <laughs> All right. My next question was, do you depend on cine clips? Do you have cine clips kind of as part of your scan protocol in cases of confusion or for correlating with M mode or what's your kind of protocol with, with cines? Yes. Versus M -mode? Yes, we do. Um, the cines can be really nice because then you can um, 
in real time see just how um, much less one diaphragm is moving as compared to the other. Right. And then the and last it also, oh, sorry. All right, so go ahead. With respect to your question or somebody's question earlier about how to pick which breath um, you want to use as the true kind of, um, the true breath, I think those cine clips also give you a better idea of, of the pattern. All right, makes sense. Yeah, that was the first time for me seeing that. So it's good to know that you can actually cine through the M mode breathing too. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. Right. And then another audience question was, uh, do you have any specific tips for getting the child to remain still during the examination? Do you feed them or do anything else to kind of remove that motion motion artifact as much as possible? Honestly, the majority of these patients are post-op cardiac um, or NICU babies. And so it, it isn't too much of a challenge. Um, in our older patients, uh, the advantage of, to them is you can actually do provocative maneuvers, have them sniff in, take deep breaths, do things to kind of accentuate um, diaphragmatic motion. Um, in the in the little ones, it really it doesn't seem to be an issue. They're mostly in incubators. Right. The next question was: Is the are you using the angle of the diaphragm to help kind of differentiate hernia versus eventration? Um, I don't know what you mean by uh, angle, we don't take, um, uh, like an actual measurement. Um, but certainly we go, um, sagittally with the high resolution linear images and we try to find that, uh, blunt end, or it almost makes like an H shape when there's a hernia there. Um, and then we, uh, go from a medial approach as well and see if we can find the opposite end kind of near the heart border, which is much more difficult, but sometimes we get lucky. So no, in short, to an actual okay. quantitative okay. angle. <laughs> okay. cool. All right. So that's that's all the audience questions I have for now. I don't know if Judy or Hattu, if you guys had any other comments or questions. I don't know if um, there are any like pitfalls or you know anything that you've run into that may have caused it to have like a false positive or a false negative or anything like that. Um, yes. So certainly, um, I, I would say actually the largest pitfall is where the cursors are placed, um, which is why I was saying that the uh, technique is just really, really important. So uh, measuring up, up the way as opposed to down the way um, on the slopes can really impact it. Um, other things, I, th I think that's really the main one that we fall into. Uh, oftentimes, because it's you know doesn't have ionizing radiation and you don't have to move the patient, we often repeat these studies and um, assess how things are changing, either worsening or improving over time. Um, like that one patient that I showed who uh, improved six days later. In that case, I think it was a true improvement, but I suppose if there's um, uncertainty regarding the validity of the findings, then that would be the best thing to do is just repeat it and go up yourself. That was quite a Donald Trumpy sort of non-answer. I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. It's good to know that the test doesn't seem to have a lot of like technical issues that can rent, you know, that can lead you to like false diagnoses. So that's good. All right. All right. So for, for my portion, you know, I'm not talking about diaphragm, but this is just more just a smattering of kind of the overall kind of utility of ultrasound. Uh, this is mostly going to be focusing on, um, kind of neonatal chest, uh, but we'll just talk about uh, several different cases and kind of how we can use ultrasound for evaluation of the chest. Uh, so this was our first case. Uh, so this was a newborn came in with an abnormal uh, prenatal ultrasound. Uh, so this was, had some prenatal imaging. Uh, they had initially told us that there was concern for pulmonary sequestration um, on that outside report. Uh, we didn't have that imaging available for review, uh, but this was their first uh, radiograph that was uh, taken after birth. Uh, so we can see there's this abnormal opacity within the um, left upper lobe. Uh, so kind of had a broad differential, you know, that we know that a lot of congenital lung lesions uh, after birth are sometimes can be fluid filled uh, rather than being aerated. Uh, the other thing we were thinking about, you know, could this be an abnormal configuration of the um, thymus? You know, the thymus oftentimes is very prominent in neonates. Uh, this wasn't quite the typical morphology of the thymus, uh, but those were kind of the main things we were thinking about. Uh, so on ultrasound, uh, we interrogated that region so we can see there's this kind of homogeneous kind of speckled appearance uh, to that left upper lobe. Um, and playing through this cine clip so we can see that aerated segment of the left lower lobe. 
Um, and then again, that kind of abnormal, very more homogeneous appearance to the uh, left upper lobe. Uh, so this patient uh, was lost to uh, follow-up. Uh, we did recommend some additional imaging, but they ended up coming back in uh, a few years later at four years of age. Uh, so at this point, uh, we can see there's abnormal hyperinflation, uh, increased lucency within that left upper lobe. And there's overall just kind of pruning of va the vascularity up there. Uh, patient had a, subsequently had a CT done, uh, showed very similar findings. Uh, so we can see normal appearance of the right lung, and then that left lung, again, just has diminished vascularity uh, with increased lucency within it. Uh, and then on this coronal image, uh, where I have marked with arrows here, we can see there's this focal kind of discontinuity within the left upper lobe bronchus. Uh, we can see that area of mucus plugging there. Uh, so this ended up being a case of uh, bronchial atresia. Uh, so this ended up being just kind of abnormal retained fetal lung fluid uh, within an abnormal segment of lung that ended up getting aerated later on in life. Uh, so I have a couple, this is from the literature just to kind of show you that this I think is a very uncommon uh, diagnosis to make both prenatally and postnatally, especially with ultrasound. Uh, so we can see that the overall kind of pathology here is that there's just kind of impaired transit of fluid uh, through that uh, abnormal lung segment. Uh, so it ends up appearing hyperechoic on uh, prenatal ultrasound and then has increased fluid signal on uh, prenatal uh, MRI. Uh, so again, diagnosis of bronchial atresia. Uh, most commonly, this affects the left upper lobe, as we had in our case. Now, the other main uh, kind of differential for this would be a congenital lobar overinflation. I uh, would kind of have a similar look to it. Uh, but just remember that the overall kind of uh, concept that these can have retained fluid and can uh, be fluid filled at birth rather than having that hyper aeration. I mean, you guys can feel free to stop me at any point if you guys have any additional questions or comments. Or oh, just a comment on that yeah. one. And I think it would be really hard to tell um, CLO from BA if you just had the CT afterwards. So it's nice right. that you had the radiographs to kind of show that it was collapsed because the CLO will have like direct communication with bronchial trees. So those usually aerate right away versus okay. BA where a lot of the aeration is just kind of like um, passive diffusion of air, like through like the pores of con. So it, it takes time. So it takes a few months before you can actually see any aeration. Okay, cool. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not a field imager just for the record. So I definitely appreciate your expertise in that regard. <laughs> Uh, so this is our next case. Uh, this patient had a prenatal diagnosis of CPAM. So I have the fetal MRI for you here. So we can see there's this hyper intense uh, mass that has some of these kind of fluid filled cystic spaces. Uh, this was shortly after birth. Uh, so we can see there's these uh, abnormal areas of increased lucency uh, and then just kind of this relatively homogeneous opacification throughout the rest of the left lung. Uh, so ultrasound was done mostly to, you know, the overall extent of the abnormality on the ultrasound or on the radiograph seemed a little bit more extensive uh, than we were expecting uh, from that MRI. Uh, so this is the actual lesion itself. Uh, so we can see there are some aerated uh, portions of it. Uh, we can see there are some fluid-filled uh, kind of cystic spaces. Um, we can also see there's a large amount of pleural fluid on that side. Uh, so patient kind of had a, a turbulent uh, clinical course. Uh, so they had a follow-up ultrasound done a couple weeks later. Uh, so at this time, we can see there's a very large amount of pleural fluid on the right side. Uh, we can also see uh, they've developed this kind of subpulmonic effusion at the left lung base. Uh, so this is our lesion right here. And then we can see this very complex appearing uh, pleural fluid with all these septations within it. Uh, so they ended up de developing tension hydrothorax and had bilateral uh, chest tubes placed. And these are found to be uh, chylus pleural effusions. Uh, so they ended up having a MR lymphangiogram, which, done, which I'm showing you just a couple of representative images for you here. So we can see that there's uh, extensive body wall edema, uh, the abnormal appearance of the lungs. Uh, this is our lesion here. Uh, this is the first time we were able to see this particular uh, feeding vessel uh, coming from the uh, descending thoracic aorta. Um, so this patient, uh, this ended up being kind of a weird case. Uh, this was resected and ended up being an extra lobar sequestration, uh, which I think we were all kind of surprised about um, prenatally. And then even the postnatal appearance, uh, we were all thinking there's probably going to be a CPAM. And then after we saw this, you know, at least a hybrid lesion. Um, I think the you know, we know that sequestration don't have that communication with the tracheobronchial tree. So it was kind of weird that this on that initial radiograph looked like it had some aerated components to it. Um, at surgery, they were found to have these kind of necrotic, uh, purulent uh, infected components to it. Uh, so sequestrations can sometimes have, have air within them when they get super infected. Um, so that was overall kind of what happened in this case. And um, the other kind of interesting thing about this case was they had these chylus pleural effusions, uh, just a rare association um, with some of these congenital lung lesions. All right, um, next one, this is another infant uh, came in with respiratory distress. Uh, so this first uh, day of life three radiograph, uh, the main thing I'm showing you here is that they 
did not have anything that resembled a congenital lung lesion. Uh, so they have this kind of nonspecific, uh, just hazy opacification of the right, uh, more than left lung. Uh, they were admitted this whole time. And then you know, a few weeks later, they uh, ended up having uh, respiratory distress, just uh, clinically started de deteriorating. Uh, so had this abnormal uh, opacity, kind of some cystic uh, appearing lucencies within there, uh, and this kind of rounded lesion here. Uh, so on ultrasound, uh, this had this very kind of complex appear appearance to it, had this kind of thick rind of echogenic tissue uh, with all this kind of uh, complex and heterogeneous appearing stuff internally. Uh, I'll play through that cine for you, uh, kind of showing you similar things. Uh, this ended up being very confusing for us. We were main thing we were trying to de determine whether this was, you know, we thought this was infection, but we weren't sure if it was kind of super infection of some underlying congenital lung lesion. Uh, so we had this image here, which you know looks like we're getting arterial flow from a relatively central aspect of the lesion. Uh, so we ended up doing both a CT and an MRI. This was kind of just throwing things at the wall and see when it's stuck, just to see what uh, we can determine about this lesion. I would say overall, we didn't really get a whole lot more information than what we saw in that ultrasound. Uh, so we can see this thick rind of hyper-enhancing tissue with uh, necrotic uh, central fluid uh, and an overall similar appearance on the MRI. Uh, we did not see a, a, a feeding vessel or anything else to uh, make us think there was some kind of underlying lesion there. Uh, so this patient ended up going to the OR and they ended up having this um, cavitary lobar pneumonia. All right, next couple of cases are some more prenatal cases. Uh, so this was a patient that had this prenatally diagnosed mass. Uh, so we can see that there's this uh, hyperintense mass just immediately on a left super renal region just right next to the aorta. Uh, looking hyper intense on MRI and then has this kind of echogenic appearance to it on ultrasound. Uh, so overall, a couple different uh, differential considerations, you know, things like sequestration can have this appearance, uh, thinking about uh, things of adrenal origin. Uh, so either, you know, things like neuroblastoma. Uh, so patient had an ultrasound immediately after birth. Uh, so I, should, I think kind of pointed to help point us in a different direction. Uh, so we can see the uh, kidney here, we can see the adrenal gland, and we can see that this lesion does appear to be uh, separate from the adrenal gland. Um, on ultrasound, we were also able to identify this feeding vessel here, uh, which uh, we did not see on the prenatal imaging. Uh, so this helped us point us more in the direction of something like a sequestration. Uh, patients subsequently had a CTA, which I think uh, helped nicely demonstrate this systemic uh, feeding vessel here. And um, then again, on the axial images as well. Uh, so this is the more um, kind of classic appearance of an extra lobar sequestration. And then just a companion case, uh, this is the main reason I showed you that first case. Uh, so this is a very similar prenatal appearance to it. Uh, so had this hyper intense mass, again, within the super renal space, uh, and then had this hyper appearance to it on uh, prenatal ultrasound. Uh, so again, patient had ultrasound immediately after they were born, uh, just to uh, further characterize that lesion. Uh, so more clearly, I think on the postnatal imaging, uh, we can see that there is this hyper mass uh, more clearly associated with the um, adrenal gland. Uh, so we can see a little a segment of the adrenal gland and this lesion uh, very clearly arising from that. Uh, so this patient would just observed uh, that most likely felt this was going to be a neuroblastoma. Uh, so patient had a six-week follow-up, uh, which uh, the lesion had decreased in size, uh, and then a four-month follow-up uh, had completely resolved. Uh, so this ended up being a spontaneous regression of a uh, congenital neuroblastoma. Uh, so we know that these patients that have congenital, congenital neuroblastoma, they oftentimes um, do very well. Uh, oftentimes they will spontaneously regress, and as in this patient, uh, so these uh, often can just be managed conservatively. They don't uh, necessarily need to biopsy or anything more aggressive, uh, but we can watch them and oftentimes they will regress. All right, next case uh, was a uh, patient that came in with abnormal newborn screening. Uh, so they had uh, lymphopenia that was seen and they subsequently have this chest radiograph. Uh, so we can see very abnormal appearance of the upper mediastinum. Uh, as I mentioned previously, we, oftentimes these patients will have a very uh, prominent thymus at birth, uh, but really not seeing much in the way of thymic tissue at all. Uh, so there's kind of a broad differential at this point uh, based on the newborn screening. You know, certainly things like uh, skid, so severe combined immunodeficiency uh, would be of concern uh, or versus other kind of thymic abnormalities. Uh, so we were asked to do an ultrasound just to identify whether a thymus was present, uh, get an idea of what the overall kind of appearance of it was. Uh, so this is just a still image. Uh, this is the sternal ossification center with some cartilage around it, uh, just showing there's no thymic tissue posterior to that where we would expect there to be. And then I'll play through the cine so we can see some of the great vessels of the chest and then getting down into aerated lung, uh, really nothing in the way of normal appearing thymic tissue there. Uh, so overall, this patient uh, did have additional workup. Uh, they were found to have a diagnosis of skid. Uh, they had a CT done for more for pre-bone marrow transplant. Uh, this was not done to evaluate the mediastinum as an ultrasound, uh, but this is just showing you the CT correlate, uh, just demonstrating no thymic tissue there. 
Uh, but overall, just kind of a nice case for ultrasound. It can be helpful to look at the mediastinum as well. And then for my last couple of cases, uh, shifting out to the chest wall. Uh, so this patient had a prenatally uh, diagnosed chest wall mass. Uh, so we can see in their uh, prenatal ultrasound had this very um, large mass associated with the right chest wall, has this kind of fluid-filled cystic spaces uh, with some thick septations associated with it, and then a very uh, similar appearance on the uh, MRI as well. A uh, patient had an ultrasound done immediately after birth. Um, I think the ultrasound has a couple of uh, uses in this particular scenario. Uh, one is just to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, so as we would expect to see with a lymphatic malformation, uh, we can see some flow within the septations, uh, but no flow within those cystic spaces themselves. Um, and then also this helps just give us a baseline. Uh, we know these patients will oftentimes go to on sclerotherapy with IR. Uh, so just getting a baseline and then we can follow it with ultrasound after their treatment. Um, so again, mac macrocystic lymphatic malformation. And then for my last case, uh, this is just another interesting chest wall mass. Uh, so this patient uh, likewise had a prenatally diagnosed mass. Uh, on clinical imaging, we can see this kind of discoloration, this reddish, reddish discoloration of the chest wall. On ultrasound, it has this very kind of aggressive infiltrative appearance to it. Uh, so we can see this very heterogeneous mass uh, with really no clear, clearly defined margins uh, and then very robust vascularity on the uh, color Doppler imaging. A uh, patient clinically deteriorated quite quickly. Uh, the mass was very, uh, behaving very aggressively, it increased rapidly in size. This was done a few days later after that other image I just showed you. Uh, we can see it now has this kind of focal protrusion to it, uh, has more discoloration of the skin associated with it. And then patient had an MRI at that point uh, overall, which shows a similar appearance to what we saw on ultrasound. Uh, so we can see it has very avidly enhancing mass uh, extending into some of the adjacent musculature. Uh, so this patient had additional clinic clinical workup, uh, and they were found to have very abnormal labs. Uh, they ended up having a diagnosis of Katzenbach merit phenomenon. Uh, so kind of that in combination with the um, aggressivity and the overall common, kind of imaging appearance, uh, this ended up being a, a coposiform hemangioendothelioma. Uh, so this patient was treated with uh, serolimus and did quite well. Uh, so this was uh, several months later, 14 months of age, and at least uh, clinically, it looks like the mass is pretty much completely resolved at this time. Uh, so overall, uh, this was the diagnosis of um, KHE. All right, so that was actually my last case. So that, that was just kind of to give you a uh, kind of a, a smattering of different chest ultrasound cases. Uh, I think really just highlighting the um, utility of ultrasound and the evaluation of the chest. So, you know, really we can look at the, you know, pulmonary parenchyma, pleural space, chest wall, mediastinum. Uh, really does help. Both, you know, especially in those neonatal, neonatal cases, uh, really can be helpful. Um, so uh, uh, just for a little bit more discussion about, um, again, moving away from the diaphragm kind of to the, the rest of the chest, I'm just kind of curious what your guys' clinical practices, um, kind of how you're using chest ultrasound, what you know clinical scenarios you're using it for. Um, just wanted to kind of get your input on that. I'd say the major majority of the time for us, it's um, with complicated pneumonias, um, assessing yeah. empyemas, uh, looking for pulmonary necrosis, um, not, we don't do it routinely, I would say, for congenital chest lesions. Yeah, our practice is probably pretty similar. Um, obviously, we do diaphragm, and then we'll look for, I do feel like we do a little bit too much of the pleural effusions. Um, uh, like the clinicians will want to quantify it sonographically, which I'm not sure adds much value to the care of the patients. Like if you see a small um, pleural effusion on radiographs, I'm not sure that um, a chest x-ray will help unless the question is, do we need to place a chest tube versus just do a thoracentesis if they're if they're gonna even choose to do an intervention. Um, we have not been successful decreasing those referrals yet though, unfortunately. Yeah, I would say we're very similar. Yeah, we, we do a ton of these for, um... we do quite a lot for, you know, pleural space, space evaluation and they, you know, they, it's kind of interesting because oftentimes we end up seeing a, a parenchymal, and I wouldn't say oftentimes, but occasionally we end up seeing a parenchymal abnormality, like we'll see a necrotic pneumonia or something like that, which ends up being some interesting cases. But, you know, by and large, I would say we end up doing a lot of pleural effusion ultrasound, which similar situation to you. I'm not sure how much value it always adds. I think the ones where um, we can potentially add value is when a uh, chest tube is no longer draining appropriately and trying to help them know if that's because of increased complexity or that might be resolvable with, you know, an installation of whatever they put in. Um, 
versus, you know, maybe the volume has gone down and actually the majority of what's creating the white out now is collapsed but consolidated lung. I don't know. I'm trying to throw them a bone here. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. curious if you yeah. guys are in your practice using ultrasound for evaluation of the lung parenchyma itself. You know, I, I think by and large, at least for us, a lot of that ends up being focused, you know, looking at A lines and B lines and pneumothoraces and stuff like that with ultrasound. Are, are you guys doing anything like that from the radiology department or do you kind of leave that to them to do focus for that if that's what they want to look at? Yeah, I don't think we have like specific protocols for that, but because I get so bored with looking at pleural effusions only, I will oftentimes comment on the A's and B's and all the lines and, you know, say interstitial or pulmonary edema just to be a little fancier because yeah. you know, same, but I can't bring myself to use the words A lines and B lines. I say interlobular septa, pleura, I like using anatomic. I just can't, I can't do the pocus terms. Arguably, nor should you, because I don't think somebody reading that on the floor would understand anyway. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I think that the main thing I'll look at is like if there's air, bron uh, air bronchograms present or not, then I think that can help differentiate. You know, oftentimes we'll see some kind of parenchymal abnormality next to the abnormal pleural effusion that we're mainly doing the exam for. So I, I oftentimes struggle with that, you know, differentiating analexis versus consolidation. I, I don't know if they depend on us necessarily to to make that differentiation, but I'll at least try to look at that too. Yeah, I, I think that's a super interesting point because there's some POCUS literature that mobile air bronchograms are more associated with pneumonia versus atelectasis, which I'm, I'm, I have mixed feelings on. Um, we have done a few cases with contrast enhanced ultrasound, especially in the ICU, looking at pneumonia versus, you know, whatever. But that's very, those are just like problem solving cases. I think some places do a lot more looking at like pleural abscess versus, you know, parenchymal abscess versus whatever. So, yeah, no, that's a really interesting idea to, you know, using it as a problem solving tool, you know, especially if we're looking for necrotic lung and things like that. Um, we haven't done any contrast enhanced ultrasound for that, but. Definitely a very interesting idea. Yeah, we still mostly do chest CT, but when they ask us to, we we will do contrast at ultrasound. Where do your surgeons stand um, with respect to sticking drains in necrotic lung these days? Ours still, so mostly it's IR, I will say, and they are still afraid of bleeding when they put a chest tube in a pulmonary abscess as opposed to a pleural um, collection. Um, but I, I do think there was a bad complication. You know, at this point, it's probably been five or six years ago. So, um, but this is one of those, you know, like, um, oh, I heard a funny phrase. Um, it was, uh, you know, the plural of anecdote is not data. So like, you know, we, maybe we shouldn't be making decisions just based on like one or two bad outcomes. So I'm, I'm not aware of the literature. Um, because I don't do interventions. Yeah, we're similar. I'm not super in tune with what they're doing, but yeah, I think they lean more towards avoiding it when they can. Yeah, because is it still true? Like I said, I'm not up to date with the the data either, but you know, if, if you put in a tube or any kind of intervention into like a necrotic lung, you'll actually create that bronchopleural fistula. Is that... Is that, I mean, is that the worry? So I don't know if that still stands. Yeah. Yeah. I just got a, a comment from one of our audience members that said, yeah, drains and pulmonary lesions can increase the risk of BPF. So yeah, I, I think that is still a concern. Yeah. And, and um, just another comment, the extra pulmonary sequestration of the left lower lobe, this is, I guess, your case is the fourth presentation that I've seen when they just present with pleural effusion, and we postulate that is due to torsion. Oh, interesting. So, you know, when fetuses just present out of the blue with like a lung lesion and pleural effusion, specifically on the left side, then um, I add that to my differential now. Does that make the surgeons intervene sooner or does it matter because it's like, you know, not viable it, tumor? It, I mean, it, tissue. Okay. Um, I don't think they intervene ever unless it compromises cardiac. Um, so if there is like, you know, some kind of like tension, 
pleural effusion for the fetus and they're not doing well and, you know, leading to high drops or something like that, then they can just go in and put it like a thoracal amniotic shunt to drain it, but not necessarily to like actually take out the lesion or anything. Yeah. I meant like postnatally, do they then like because sometimes they wait till the child's older, right? First okay. of all, I should, I'm should i not up to date on the surgical like guidelines. I think usually they wait until the kid is a little bit older unless it's viral season and then they time it with viral season. Um, but that's what they do here anyway. Do yeah. if you, if you question torsion of, is, torsion of the sequestration, right? Yes. Is, is the thing, yeah. So I don't, I don't think so. I don't think that rushes them to do anything unless once again, the, the patient needs it because yeah. they're decomping for other reasons. Interesting. Yeah, those those congenital lesions that you know the ultrasound I showed for those. I you know I think ultrasound is definitely not definitive for those. I I think oftentimes I'll do it immediately after birth, and it really just you know especially if there's a differential on the, the prenatal imaging like we had in a couple of our cases. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's oftentimes not definitive, but you know at least immediately after birth when they don't want to you know stick the kids straight in a CT, um, at least help triage a little bit, you know, figuring out whether it's, you know, the adrenal or whether it is truly a, a pulmonary lesion. I think it at least gives them a little bit more, more information. But I have another question. When you have, so for example, that chest wall, macrocystic lymphatic malformation, do your interventionalists or whoever's going to do the sclerotherapy or your vascular anom anomalies team, do they always want some sort of cross-sectional imaging to look at the deeper extent of those lesions? Ours do. Yeah. Some yeah. will yeah. be like, why are we even doing the ultrasound? <laughs> yeah. so if it's like, if it's adding an extra test without, you know, if yeah. they're going to get another test anyway. Yeah. I would say pretty much most vascular anomalies get an MR and MRA at diagnosis just to, you know, define the full extent of it and then, you know, make sure that our, we have, you know, full evaluation of any, you know, feeding arteries or draining veins or anything like that. I, I, do, I do think they at least will get an ultrasound because, you know, likewise in their vascular anomalies clinic, every single kid gets a, an ultrasound. I, I think that probably helps them as far as getting a baseline, you know, at, at follow-up after they do sclerotherapy, they're going to get another ultrasound. So I, I think for at least for them having that first one to compare the the subsequent one to just so that's a modality to modality comparison. I, I think that's probably the main utility for them. Yeah. And sometimes it takes a while to get into MRI. So I, 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 I think there is still a role for ultrasound because you can like you said, follow it and get the image, like to have like at least a better idea of what you're working with besides just physical exam. So we try to avoid MR if it's going to require um, a GA. And so most of ours will be only ultrasound follow-up until they're an age where they can tolerate the MR without GA. And then there's a, or a comment from one of our audience members that says the microcystic components are better evaluated by ultrasound, and then that can change where they target for sclerotherapy. Um, yeah, so we know these can be combined macrocystic and microcystic. So, I, yeah, so that's definitely a good point as well. 